pleasure to introduce Professor Sheena Iyengar, who is the inaugural ST Lee Professor of Business in the Columbia Business School. She's considered one of the world's leading experts on the psychology of choice and decision making, addressing how humans face challenges in a world where they are inundated with options. I'm sure no one here has that problem. <laughs> Professor Iyengar's current research has expanded to examine how we construct ourselves in social networks and how we experience authenticity in an increasingly technological and uncertain world. If you haven't seen her TED Talks, you definitely should. Leading a firm that works in this same field, I really appreciated how you can relate to the topic through her presentation. In addition, with so many organizations struggling to keep up, or better yet, lead through effective innovation, her work on how we create and select innovative ideas likely applies to most, if not all, of us in this room. Professor Iyengar has authored three dozen articles which appear in top academic journals, just to name a few, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Financial Times, the New Yorker. In addition, her book, uh, The Art of Choosing, was a finalist for the Financial Times and Goldman Sachs Business Book of the Year number one watched NHK documentary in the last 10 years, and ranked number three on Amazon's Best Business and Investing Books of 2010. Over her career, she was voted one of Thinkers 50's most influential business thinkers. Try to say that three times fast. <laughs> um, and Poets and Quants ranked her among the world's best B-school professor, of course, after our time, at least my time. Um, in addition to conducting research and teaching, uh, Professor Iyengar uh, frequently speaks to audiences that range from Fortune 500 companies and nonprofits to government bodies and medical institutions around the world. Collect collectively, her TED Talks have received over 5.5 million views. Without further ado, Professor Iyengar. Thank you. It's wonderful. To oh, let me take this. <laughs> It's wonderful to be here today, and thank you so much for coming out. I mean, it's a beautiful day in New York. Uh, you can't have, you, you can't ask for a better day, and we're all spending it together, and that's also beautiful. So thank you so much for coming today. By the way, this is just as you guys are celebrating your alum year. Uh, this is my 20th year at Columbia Business School. Uh, <laughs> They asked me to talk about authentic leadership. And the way I thought about talking about that is I thought to myself, well, where does all that begin? And it all starts by telling a story. So I thought what I would do today is start by telling you the story of my life. I was born in the midst of a giant blizzard in Toronto, Canada. And I'm not going to tell you the year. <laughs> My, my mother was all alone that night. She had just recently migrated from India. My father was still trying to get his immigration papers in order so that he could join her. And so there she was, all by herself in this foreign country with a newborn baby in her arms in the midst of a blizzard. And I sometimes try to imagine what it must have been like for her that night. I imagine her holding this newborn baby in her arms, standing next to the window, maybe watching these snowflakes whirling around, snowflakes that she was seeing for the very first time in her life. I imagine her asking herself the big question that all of us ask ourselves when we have a newborn child is, what's going to become of this kid anyway? <laughs> Unbeknownst to her, the low visibility of that night and the absence of my father would prove important for things to come. Now, at that moment of my birth, you might say that everything about my life was already known. All you had to do was read it in the stones or in the stars, consult your astrologer, your palm reader. You might say that at that moment of my birth, everything about my life had already been predetermined, either by the hand of God or by some other unnameable force. And the only thing left for me to do now was to act out that text. So that is one story of my life. Now let me tell you another story of my life. Life is filled with surprises. It's like a jack-in-the-box. You turn the crank slowly, one rotation at a time, but sometimes things just spring up and out unexpectedly, which is exactly what I decided to do. I sprang out one month earlier than I was supposed to, and as you already know, my father wasn't even there to receive me. 
My mother, who had never intended to leave India, in fact, had been told by multiple palm readers that she would never set foot off of her motherland, found herself transported to Canada, then to New York City, and now resides in this little town in New Jersey. My parents were devout Sikhs, and everywhere they went, they took with them their religion. So when I was growing up, I used to go to the, the Sikh temple known as the Gurudwara every Friday night, Saturday night, most of Sunday. I was taught to practice the five Ks. My parents, if there wasn't already a Sikh temple there, they helped create one. And like a good Sikh kid, you know, I was going to grow up to be a doctor, an engineer. We, we didn't really have other thoughts at that time about other possible <laughs> careers. And, you know, when the moment was right, you know, a suitable boy would be chosen for me just like it had been done for my mother. So that was the plan. But we all know what happens to the best laid plans of mice and men. Um, when I was a toddler, by then we were in New York City, I was about three years old, and my parents started to wonder why they had to constantly shout, watch out. Surely even a klutz would notice a parking meter on occasion. <laughs> the mystery was solved one day by an eye specialist that was right here at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital, um, who told my parents that I had been born with this rare form of retinitis pigmentosa and that I would go blind sometime during my school years. Well, we've all heard the saying, right, that misfortunes befall the resilient. We've heard that. We've also heard that it is only when misfortunes befall us that we become resilient. <laughs> and I think we've all lived long enough that we don't actually know which one is true. <laughs> So no matter, even the resilience can have the wind knocked out of them. So when I was 13, my father woke up one morning and he complained of leg pain. We all told him to go to the doctor and he said you would, but he never made it there. Um, later that day, he was found collapsed on the streets of Manhattan. And by the time he actually made it to the, to the emergency room, he had his third and final heart attack and, and was gone. Hearing all this, you might say that my life is made up solely of random and unpleasant events. And you might start asking the big questions that at different points in our lives we all ask ourselves. How much can I really plan for my future when I can only see so far and when the weather can change faster than I might say, surprise. It was supposed to rain all day today, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the second story of my life. Now I'm going to tell you a third story, and although it is again my story, I think it's the story of every single one of you guys. My parents chose to leave India. They chose to go to Canada. They chose to come to the United States. My father used to boast when he crossed over that border in New York, he had exactly one dollar in his pocket, but he brought with him a lot of dreams. He expected, of course, that the city, that the streets of the city of New York were going to be paved in gold, but they weren't. They were instead paved in lots of potholes. But he brought with him dreams. And I was born into that dream. And you might say that as someone learning the language of that dream, because I grew up in the schools of this country, that perhaps like you, I learned that lingua franca of that dream even better than our immigrant parents did. Because what I learned was that what shined so bright in the center of that dream that you could see it, even if you were blind like me, was choice. I could have chosen to see my life in terms of fate or chance, but I chose to see my life in terms of what was still possible and what I could still make happen. Take a look at these photos. I'm sure you recognize most, if not all the people here, and whether, whether you agree with their philosophies or the actions that they took, you'd have to acknowledge that they were all leaders in their own right. Can any of us imagine walking out the door, or at least our children walking out the door, without some form of Steve Jobs on them? <laughs> okay. Can any of us imagine a, a Supreme Court now without the likes of a Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who actually changed our dialogue around women's rights in this country? 
can anybody imagine a world in which the moment we're angry at some of our politicians, we don't get to demonstrate the way Gandhi taught us to do. He wasn't just an advocate of the poor, the advocate of Indian independence. He essentially gave us the tools by which we regularly practice civil disobedience. So what was it that enabled these people to be leaders? Was it fate? You know, sometimes people are just born leaders. They possess this almost supernatural power to draw others to them. We, we call that charisma. Was it just chance? Serendipity, we might say. Sometimes people happen to be born at the right place and are at the right time and are therefore given the opportunity to be leaders. Or was it choice? We saw a problem, they identified a solution, they acted on it. And that's what made all the difference. You and I could tell the story of any one of these leaders in terms of fate, chance, or choice. And no matter how you tell the story of their lives, there would be an element of truth to it. Now, I want you to think of your own lives. What were the circumstances of your birth? that enabled you to get to the position that you are in today, that enabled you to be as successful as you are. Think about that. Maybe one or two things, just hold it in your heads. What were those random events or those random encounters? Someone you met, maybe somebody you met at Columbia Business School, maybe somebody you met before, maybe somebody you met after, maybe something you saw subconsciously or consciously, that ended up affecting what you ended up doing with your life. What were some of those? And what were some of the choices that you made? Now I guarantee you that if you thought about this exercise, wrote it all down, started collecting it all up, what you discover is that the answers to all three questions will be different. And the answers to each of these three questions will tell you something new about how it is you came to be who you are. But I think there's something very special when we tell the story of our lives in terms of choice. Because it is only when we tell the story of our lives in terms of choice that it gives meaning to everything we say and do. In the end, choice is the only one of these three forces that puts control in your hands. It's the only tool we have that enables us to go from who we are today to whom we want to be tomorrow. And it is therefore the most powerful tool we have for shaping our lives and the world around us. Ultimately, we are all evaluated by the choices that we make. And so what I want us to take some time doing today is really talk about how do we get the most from choice. In the end, we are all the sum of all our choices. So how do we use choice to write the story of our lives, the lives and the stories that we want to tell about ourselves, the stories that we want told about us? Now, I've been told you guys have been given paper. Is that true? So that means I get to actually give you exercises. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If you don't have paper, raise your hands, but I'm ready to tell you your first exercise. <laughs> Okay. 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 What do you want to accomplish one year from today? Just jot it down. That should be a really easy one for you guys. What do you want to accomplish one year from today at the next reunion? By the next reunion, what do you want to accomplish? Write it down.
And since you all know that I'm a believer in not too much choice, don't make it a laundry list. A couple things. Okay. All right. Next question. What do you want to accomplish five years from today? from today. Remember, you're still coming to reading rooms. the question one year from today. Clap your hands. Great observation. So it is absolutely true that we live in an eminently dynamic and uncertain world, and that is precisely why you always want to set goals every six months. <laughs> okay, now when I say set goals, I don't mean I'm going to be the CEO of X company doing X thing. Can't be that specific. That's often the mistake people make. Goal setting means coming up with your, your desire. I want to become I, I want to start some kind of an entity that does this. Or I want to rise up and be known as a specialist in this thing. It's a desire. Your goal is a, your long-term goal is a desire. And the reason why you set goals is because it serves as your compass. Because you do live in a world that's inundated with lots of choice and information. And there's going to be things coming at you from all different directions. And you need to have a goal because it tells you, okay, no, 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 this could be interesting. Okay, that's why you need to know where, you're, where you want to go. And you do want to write it down. So now I'm going to show you one of my very favorite studies. People were divided up into three groups. One group came up with their goals, and their head just left it there. Another group came up with their goals, wrote it down. A third group came up with their goals, wrote it down, and shared it with a trusted other. The second group achieves 50% more. The third group achieves 75% more than the first group. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not that you achieve what you set out to achieve. If you're going to make it really specific. You're not going to. You're going to essentially what goals do is it keeps you on focus. It keeps you targeted, such that you are continually learning and building and achieving. I'm going to give you another thing that's related to this that's also very important, and that's to keep a progress journal. So that every day, for three minutes, you're going to write in your progress journal. Keep this separate. I mean, if you, if you write a real diary about all your feelings, that this is not that. This is something <laughs> separate. Um, a progress journal is all you do in there in bullet form. What did I learn today? What did I accomplish today? Learning meaning, what did I fail at that I can now extract a, extract a lesson from? Accomplish, what did I do today? It's very important to do that because we are living in such a fast-paced world that we are so bad at keeping track of all the things we actually accomplished and all the things that we could build on. 
So often there is low hanging fruit that's staring us in the face that could solve our problems if we only paid more attention. So that learning journal, essentially you've got this bullet and what you discover is what you did yesterday actually connects with what you just did today and now you can connect those and combine and give you something that actually creates something that's more valuable than either one of those. And it's helping you get closer to your goals. By the way, they found that when employees did this, they did this with over 30,000 employees from 300 different organizations, these were mainly service employees, they found that these employees were not only more innovative at their jobs, but they were overall happier both at their jobs as well as in their personal lives. It's actually a useful thing to do. So for my first tip today, really set goals. Set it, I would say, at least once a year. And take your time setting it. I actually personally, um, I set it every year. I start on my birthday, which is in November, and I take about a month to really think about it, and I only finish it on New Year's Eve. All right, here's another, here's a, maybe a harder question to think about. If I were to ask you, what are the five values, the five values that are really important to you? Do you know how to boil it down to just five? Now, of course, we all care about things like, you know, being a good team player, being nice, being smart, being considerate, listening to people, being a, you know, a equal opportunity. Being, I mean, I, I could go down the list, having integrity. I mean, I could probably come up with at least 25, 30 things that I think are really good things to be. Work-life balance, right? So, but can we boil it down to the top five? Can we do all those trade-offs? What I'm now gonna do is do a, a little, a, a mini exercise with you. I mean, we could actually do this, we could spend a whole 90 minutes just on this, but I'm going to do a little mini exercise to give you a taste of this, and then that way you can think about it some more later. So, so we're going to do a little mini exercise to get to what our five values might look like. Okay? So here's the first question. I want you to think about a moment in time that happened to you maybe the most recent time, when you really, really felt hurt. Somebody did something that really hurt you. Okay, I don't want you to write that down. I just want you to recall that moment and now ask yourselves, what was missing? What was missing that made you feel hurt? <clears throat> maybe it was fairness, maybe it was compassion, maybe it was honesty. Maybe it was respect. What was missing? Just jot those down. Maybe, maybe two or three things. question. I want you to think of a moment when you felt really, really great. You just really felt great. What was present at that moment? Maybe you had a sense of accomplishment. Maybe you just felt contentment or peace. 
What was present at that moment when you felt really, really great? present. Maybe you felt competent, maybe you felt connected, maybe you, you know, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what, what was present? My 13 year old would say the moment he felt important was when he knew it was hot. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's done pretty much? Yeah. Good? Okay. So, what you're going to do with all these responses is you can actually make a, a values map. So I'm going to first show you my values map, and by no means is my values map meant to be an anchor or reference point here. Everybody gets their own values map. It's individual to you. It's your individual expression. This is another way in which you can express who you are. And so I'm showing you mine. And notice how each value is in a, in a circle because you're creating a map of each of your five values are in a circle and you can create whatever picture you want. They could be overlapping, they could be equal status, they could be a hierarchy, they could be a pyramid, whatever you want. Okay, so for me, it's really love and impact. The foundation is love, goal is impact, and what are the qualities of that? In integrity, compassion, and creativity. Okay? Every single one of you will have a different one. There might be overlapping values across, and you certainly know from doing this for years with Columbia alums and MBA students that there are certain common values to our, our certain demographics, but each individual still has different ones. I want you to create your own. And I understand right now you're going to create a rough draft. You're going to iterate on this. It's going to bother you for the next 48 hours. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a good thing. I want it to bother you. So just come up with a real rough draft right now.
Everybody have their maps? Some rough draft of one? Great. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn to your neighbor and describe your values to your neighbor and tell them why they matter to you. And then the only thing your neighbor is going to do other than listening to you is say, thank you. <laughs> and then your neighbor is going to tell you their values. And you're going to listen. And then what are you going to say? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Go ahead and get started. <laughs> Empathy, impact, like collaboration, integrity, and I wasn't sure what the last one was out of the other things. So I thought integrity means like doing things that are
feelings? Good. Clarifying. Clarifying. Why, why was it clarifying? Because when you say it out loud, then it's, I think when you speak it into existence, it becomes a little more real. Hey, what's your name? Deidre. Deidre said it's, it, it becomes more real because I've said it out loud. Any other observations about yourself as you said it out loud? Can you check for coherence? <laughs> okay, so you're able to see okay, do I actually make sense as a human being? Okay, good. What's your name? Okay, so we're going to we're gonna say you're coherent. <laughs> okay. We were also saying that... What's your name? Uh, my name is Virginia. Uh -huh. And what we were saying is that we recognize that they change over time. That if I had written this five years ago, it would be very different or ten years ago. Okay, that's a great point. Okay, so they do change over time. I'll, I'll say something about that. Okay, how did it feel to listen to somebody else's values? What did you learn? What did you learn in that process? Like it seems. Sorry. I'm What's Rajiv. your name? Rajiv. Okay. What? It was like you're seeing someone more deeply. I mean, even though my partner and I have had various conversations in the last day and a half, just this was a deeper understanding of the person. Okay, you felt more of a connection. Okay. Any other observations? I thought it was interesting that. What's your name? Henry. Henry. We did it with two people, but their values are not my values. They were different. There was some overlap, but they were different. And then the ones that were different, it made me kind of reflect on my own and saying, are those my values? And, and maybe my values should be those values. <laughs> <laughs> and you do all kinds of exercises to create connection. Simply having a conversation with people that feels organic. I mean, you know, obviously I curated it. <laughs> I'm guilty as charged. But simply having the informal conversation about your values, it's a great way to really feel a connection and start to build a relationship with somebody. They get to see a little more of you in a way that, that is, that is real, makes you feel vulnerable, and at the same time, if you think about it, it there's no risk there. What, what do you lose by someone understanding who you are, what your core values are? You're not giving away any trade secrets there. Okay? So, um, I'll tell you some other reasons why knowing your values are helpful. So, knowing your values you know, we often make the link between values and your decisions. In fact, on your day-to-day -day basis, it's really your goal setting that's going to affect your decisions. Okay, and that learning journal, that progress journal, and then some of the other things we're going to talk about really affect your day-to-day -day decision making. <coughs> the way, the moments when values really become important is when it's an ethical choice. It's that slippery slope type thing. Having a sense of what your values are are important. Because when you do have that moment when you really don't know, I don't want to say right and wrong, because there's, there's too many, you know, one of the things that's happened in the modern era is right, there's multiple rights and there's multiple wrongs, right? It's about figuring out, you know, which one do you fall on, right? And having a sense of what your values are really becomes important in helping you decide what you're okay with and what you're not and what your boundary conditions are. And so that's why it's important. That's, that's the way in which it really helps you with your decisions. 
The other way in which it really helps you is that when you set goals, particularly your long-term goals, they should be consistent with what your values are. If there's a misalignment there, something or another is going to make you feel inauthentic. Right? So in that sense, your notion of coherence, even though I was picking on you a little bit, is actually very important. Okay? Now, the other way in which values become important is that when you, if as a leader, you're able to be more aware of your values. So look, we, we all have values. We've been born with values, uh, raised with values. But we're not always, they're not always salient to us. And often, the moments in which they become salient to us is when somebody's violated them. Like, what? That person did what? That's just wrong, right? That's when we suddenly be like, wait a second. I disagree, right? But having a sense of what your values are, particularly as a leader when you're articulating your goals to other people, and we often are, I want my team to be aligned with where we're going and the why, you will do a much better job communicating if you understand and have it more present for you what your core values are. Because then you're more likely to communicate your goals in a way that better expresses the intention behind your goals. So often when we're communicating to others, we communicate to them where we want them to go, but we take for granted that they will understand what our intentions are. By having your values more salient to you, you will do a, you'll automatically, almost subconsciously, start to incorporate that in your language such that it's more apparent to you. You will end up feeling more authentic in your communications. It will also be more apparent to others who observe you giving those presentations. In fact, we've done a number of studies, Paul Ingram and I here, where we've done this with executives as well as students where not only do we have them construct speeches or have seen them give speeches, we videotape them and they're observed by others, both people that know them and people that don't know them. And when they have their values in hand before they've given their speech, they're much more likely to be perceived as authentic. Now, let me just address really quickly the notion of how often do they change. They're not going to change as often as your goals. Your goals will change, so you'll revise them, you'll edit them about every year. Um, you'll be surprised at how much editing you do on those. You'll still be generally moving in the same direction, but you'll be revising and editing. When it comes to your values, though, you typically don't edit them that much. Um, usually, the moments at which you edit those will happen about once a decade. Right? We always assume at the beginning of our new decade that we're you know, really going to be the same person by the end. We change more than we think we do, and we think we will. We do change less, though, with each subsequent decade. Uh, the other thing that happens to us is when there is a pivotal moment or a crisis in our life, getting married, having a child, uh, going to a particular education, like a graduate degree, all of you would have changed during that time when you did your MBA. All of you would have changed once you had a serious romantic relationship. All of you would have changed to some extent when you had children. All of you would have changed during the time of your midlife crisis. You start to see people important to you die. These are moments when health issues, these are moments when we start to rethink our values. Um, all right, so for the second tip, create a values map. Now, for those of you who are interested, if you create one, you feel really good about it. One of the things we do do for Columbia, for Columbia people <coughs> is if you email me, I will get you your values card laminated by the Bernstein Center. <laughs> people do keep it in their pockets and they carry them around. So for anybody who wants it, it is there for you as a gift. All right, how many choices do you think you make in a typical week in your life? Just call out some numbers. A thousand, too many, what are some other numbers? 10,000. 10,000? That it? Does anybody, God bless you, does anyone make more than 10,000? Infinite. Infinite. All right, so we're ranging anywhere from 1,000 to infinite. <laughs> By the way, Americans do see themselves as making more choices than anybody else in the world. <laughs> um, and, you know, some of those are perceived, some of those are real. They do have a lot of, there is actually, though, a lot of choice in the world, right? So in the 1970s, uh, the average grocery store had about 9,000 products in it. Today, the average grocery store is about over 40,000 products. 
Um, Walmart has 100,000 in its brick and mortar, a million or more in their online. Um, Amazon has more than 350 million now. Uh, Starbucks has 8,000 for combinations of all. Uh, and those are just, you know, uh, what you wear, what you eat, what book you read, um, maybe what movie you watch. Um, now let's look at the kinds of choices that didn't exist not too long ago um, that are really commonplace today, like how do you find your soulmate? Um, I, I remember when I was a PhD student, when Match.com just got started, we now have 8,000 different online dating sites in the world. By the way, that is a real export. We, we, we've done a great job exporting this thing called online dating. Um, like gluten, did you know you can find your soulmate like gluten-free only, cat lovers, farmers? choices, but it's actually really true that it's not just that you have more choices in traditional domains, but the number of domains and the kinds of domains in which we have choice today, we're not even prepared. We don't even know how to make those choices, you know, like quality versus quantity of life. Every single one of us are going to have to make that choice at some point in our lives, either for ourselves or for a loved one. Uh, and, you know, we're already beginning to make decisions about what our uh, genetic makeup of our unborn child children is going to be, and these kinds of com complex choices are only going to expand. Now, the amount of information we consume today is also exploding. Uh, we, uh, each of us, generate an average of six newspapers worth of data every single day. Uh, we consume, on average, subconsciously, consciously, the amount of information coming at us. If we're working, working citizens in a developing nation, is the equivalent of uh, reading about 174 newspapers per day. We check our phones at least 50 times a day. Uh, we spend about 28% of our week on social media, et cetera. And then I could go on. So we have a lot of, in, there's, in, there's choice explosion, there's information explosion. Uh, some of you might know that uh, one of the studies that I uh, um, have been cited for doing, um, both positively and negatively, and, you know, um, is something called the JAM study. Um, which I did a number of years ago, actually I did it in uh, the year 2000 is when it came out. And it's often referred to as the JAM study, but it was the first study that asked the question, uh, what are the consequences of offering people more and more choice? Mm -hmm. um, and, and essentially in that study, what we did was we, uh, it, was a, it was a very, at that time it was a unique store, it was called Draeger's, I, I was a PhD student at the time at Stanford. And, and I didn't know at the time that this was a tipping point. I really didn't know that you know this was going to be a normal store. Uh, this store had 250 different types of mustards, vinegars, mayonnaises, over 500 different types of fruits and vegetables. Um, and, and I wondered, you know, how come I would go to the store? I loved going to the store, but then I would still go to Safeway to do my grocery shopping. <laughs> <laughs> so after a series of discussions, we did this study that has been since been dubbed the JAM study. By the way, Draeger's doesn't talk to me anymore. Um, <laughs> and they didn't even talk to Fareed Zakaria when CNN did a whole thing on this study. Um, and so I'll tell you the real story of this study. The JAM aisle had 348 different types of JAM at that time. And we picked Wilkin and Sons, which is the Queen of England's JAM. And we put out a tasting booth where we either had six different flavors of JAM or 24 different flavors of JAM. And we set it up near the entrance of the store. And we looked at one of two things. Well, we looked at two things. First, in which case were people more likely to stop and sample some jam? And so more people stopped when there were 24 on display, 60% versus 40% when there were six on display. And, and there were different populations, so they, the, the fact that they add up to 100% is, is an accident. Um, now, when you looked at their buying behavior, now you saw the opposite effect. Of the people who stopped when there were 24 on display, only 3% of them bought a jar of jam. Whereas of the people who stopped when there were 6 on display, 30% of them bought a jar of jam. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, the way the news talks about this study is they say this shows that too much choice is bad. Okay, the, the, the actual, if you paid attention to what I just said, the message is much more nuanced than that. We are attracted to larger displays of choice. We want more choice, but when it comes down to making a choice, we're more able to make a choice when we have less than more. Right? 
And that's actually what's going on. We want more choice because of all the opportunities it potentially gives us, but we don't know actually how to act on that. Right? And so we experience conflict, and when we experience conflict, we don't know what to choose, we don't know how to choose, and so we don't. Now, since this study was published, there's actually hundreds of studies that have been done, some by me, some by others, but across many different domains, when you look at the medical arena, the financial arena, consumer markets, retail environment, uh, dating, uh, looking at jobs, quality of life versus quantity of life type decisions, and essentially there are three main consequences observed by giving people more and more choice. The first is that when they have more choice, they are more likely to delay making a choice, the proverbial choose not to choose, not because they don't want to choose, but they don't know how to choose. And they do this even when it goes against their best self-interest. The second is that the more choices people have, the more errors we make, the more inconsistent we are with our preferences. The third is that the more choices we have, the less satisfied we are with that which we've chosen. And that's true whether you're choosing a chocolate, a TV show, who you want to marry. <laughs> so, now, why is this? Certainly one of the fundamental reasons why this happens is that despite all the advances in technology, we have been very good as human beings to create a world that's actually hard for us to cognitively manage. And that's the genius of human imagination, but it's also the limitation of human imagination. So way back in 1956, the great psychologist George Miller came out with a seminal paper called The Magical Number 7 Plus or Minus 2. And in that paper, he documented basic limitations of our brains. So if I ask you to rank order from best to worst, a whole bunch of things, you know, maybe pictures of beautiful people, could be something as basic as that, to something as complex as what to, where to invest your money. <laughs> Essentially beyond seven plus or minus two, people get confused. They, they can't keep track of their preferences. Relatedly, if I ask you to keep track of information, words, numbers, pictures, and they don't give you an opportunity to memorize that information, that information beyond seven plus or minus two starts to crumble away. Now, it's not an accident that our phone numbers, when we actually used to remember them, um, <laughs> were within that range. Now, back to you, though. I just told you the consequences of choice, of having too many of them. But how does this relate to how you're going to write the story of your life? And when you think about your time, so, you know, the average CEO, when they're followed around in their daily schedule, they're making roughly almost 140 decisions, or they're engaging about 140 tasks in a week. And per task, they're engaging in roughly five different decisions. Let's say you're at a meeting and you make five different decisions. This is rough estimates. And on average, over 50% of the decisions that are made are made in nine minutes or less. About 12% of the decisions, they dedicate an hour or more of their time. Now, you guys are not that different. You might actually be making more decisions. After all, CEOs get to delegate a lot more, right? So what <coughs> the question you really want to be asking yourself is, yes, you have to make a ton more decisions. And you can't dedicate an hour or more of your time to every decision. But are the right things making it into your nine minute versus your one hour category? Right? Time is the one thing that never comes back. And how are you spending that time? And I think more and more, the big question we ought to ask ourselves is, what are we doing with our time? What are the tasks that we're engaging in our typical week? Are we taking control of our calendar? Or are we being reactive rather than proactive about what we're doing every week? When, you know, in the old days, any time you had a choice, it was considered to be such a bonus, such a plus, such an opportunity that, of course, you appreciated it and you made it. I think now the big question you want to ask yourself is, should I be making this choice? Which things did I choose on a daily basis that I should be cutting out of my life and just getting rid of that because it's noise? <coughs> Which tasks should I be combining together so that my brain can actually handle and start to chunk information? What's my value added? Right? Because if you think about it, that seven plus or minus two rule is not just important for how many things I remember you know, in a shell or how many things I'm going to remember when I listen to a speech, or how many things I want other people to remember when I'm constructing a speech, and I want people to remember what I've said in that speech. You want to be asking yourself, what is your value added? How do you want to be spending your time? And in terms of your time, the things that 
deserve an hour or more of your time on a regular basis are the things where you have your greatest value added. So one of the things that I often make the MBA students do, and I actually spend, have them spend you know, a good hour doing this, where they actually come up and look at all their tasks that they're doing in a given week, et cetera, and I actually ask them, think about all the big activities you're doing. What is your greatest value added? I'm rank order them. And pick your top three, no more than top five. Those are the things where you really want to invest your energy. Those are the things that belong in your one hour or more categories. Because in the end of the day, even if you accomplish 100 things, other people aren't going to remember all those 100 things. What are those things that you are going to make your greatest contribution at that you will be able to remember what you accomplished, how you accomplished it, be able to create that narrative around it, such that that can also be understood by others. So what's your value added? You know, I'm sure you all remember in economics, the Pareto rule, right? And, and I'll simplify it here, of course, in my own way, <laughs> which is to say that, you know, 80% of what you achieve in life is going to come from 20% of your efforts. Okay, so the bad news is you're wasting 80% of your life. <laughs> okay, the great news is that you can actually get a lot from that 20% if you're focused, right? And so you want to ask yourself, how many choices do I need? Which choices should I be making? Which choices should I actually be letting go because they're simply distracting me from my larger goals? Because to get the most from choice, you have to be choosy about choosing. So now, what have we talked about? We've said, where do I want to go? Like, what are my goals? How do I want myself to be perceived by me and others, my values? And what do I care about? Where do I want to be spending my time? Right? Be choosy about choosing. Now the big question is, I now know what I really care about. How do I make great choices? Like, how do I become choice smart? And I want to talk about two different methods around that. The first, no, no, in the process, I want to sort of dispel some of the misunderstandings that are out there in the lay public. So one of the things that you read about in books like Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell is this thing called the 10,000 hour rule, right? Which essentially says, you know, do it over and over and over and over and over again, and you'll be great. Right? You'll be a surgeon, you'll be a programmer, you'll be a musician, blah, blah, blah. Practice, 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 and you'll get to Carnegie Hall. And yet we all know lots of people in our lives that have been doing something for 30 years, and you're like, what? How did they get there? Okay. <laughs> and you can't say that, I can say it. All right. <laughs> so what is it really? I mean, 10,000 hours alone doesn't actually get you there. Um, and it's, a, it's what kind of experience actually gets you there. You know, some of you might know Paul Tetlock, one of my colleagues here. Him and his father have done a whole bunch of studies that show that even these forecasters. I mean, so many of us do forecasting for a living, and yet we're horrible at it. So I don't know why they always constantly interview these futurists who <laughs> own less than the minority of them actually do a good job. But they've been doing it for a while, so we trust them. Um, so what does make you better, though, at being a good chooser? Okay, so I'm going to just, the, way, the best way to describe this, I'm going to describe to you a couple steps. So imagine I have a bunch of kids, seven-year-old kids. And I want them to, on the day of the test, uh, pick up a bean bag and throw it in a bucket that's exactly three feet away. Okay. Now, one group of kids are going to come in every day, pick up the bean bag, and throw it in the bucket that's exactly three feet away. And they're going to do that day after day after day after day. The other group of children are going to come in, and they're going to pick up the bean bag, and they're going to throw it in the bucket. And sometimes the bucket's going to be one foot away, sometimes 10 feet away, sometimes 20 feet away. It is never three feet away. On the day of the test, though, it's three feet away. Now, which group do you think does better on the day of the test? First group, clap your hands. And second group, clap your hands. Uh, why do you think that is? You're right. Why do you think that is? Flexibility in the changing environment? Yes. You are essentially what's happening as the environment keeps changing is you're learning new strategies. So are you failing more in that case? Yeah, yeah. Yes, you're failing a lot, but you're also succeeding. If you, By the way, if you only fail, 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 no matter what they say about failure is a badge of honor, 
keep in mind that if you only fail, you're not getting any better. <laughs> <laughs> okay? You, you also, if you succeed, 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 that's, you know, you're not, you're not learning it. I mean, you're probably doing something over and over and over again, and you're just learning one pattern. Okay? That's the risk of just succeeding. I mean, you're probably not taking enough risks, right? So essentially what you want to be doing is doing lot and putting yourself in lots of different types of environments. You're experimenting. And you're doing lots of trial and error. And what that should lead to is, you know, more failure than success, but you're learning patterns. That's what essentially you're doing. In fact, even when you take students preparing for, you know, difficult college math tests, you find that if they prepare, there's one of two ways in which they can prepare. You first have, let's say, all the algebra questions, and the geometry, then the calculus, et cetera, so you organize it by topic, or you have it all in random order. Uh, the students that study the, for the exam by doing it in random order perform over three times better than the other students. So actually, if you're learning different strategies, it's creating mental flexibility, okay? Now, so first, the thing that to realize is that when you are developing the ability to choose well or be competent in a particular area, we often start, we, we stumble upon a particular algorithm and it feels comfortable and we do that over and over and over again. And as long as things don't change on you, sure, it might work. But if you actually want to know what's going on in that area, in that boundary, you're going to have to do trial and error. You're going to have to experiment. You're going to have to learn patterns. right? And so what happens when you learn these patterns, so let's imagine you have a chess master. Okay, so let's imagine when you're playing a game of chess, you're an expert and you're contemplating your next move. And when a chess master is contemplating his or her next move, what was that? Uh, just moving the slide. Oh. Uh, when you're contemplating your next move, you are thinking about eight moves ahead. If I do this, uh, my opponent will do that, I do that, and my opponent does that, you know. And if you were to actually contemplate eight moves ahead, which you would expect a chess master to do, then the number of moves and combination of moves, meaning number of choices that you would have at your disposal to consider, are more than the total number of stars in the galaxy. Wow. So just get your heads around that. And yet they do manage to make the choice in a reasonable amount of time. Now let me make that even more real for you. When you are in that ambulance, or in the emergency room, that doctor, or that, you know, whichever doctor is looking at you, just think about all the possibilities that could be wrong with you. But are they, do they have the time to consider all those? Not really. You might be dead by then, right? <laughs> so what is expertise? It is learning the patterns. How do you learn the patterns? It's experimentation plus giving yourself feedback. This worked, this didn't work, here's what I learned. Very similar to what I told you to do with your progress journal. And you're developing experiences of these patterns. That's what you're doing. Now, when you're in that moment, when you really are an expert, it is not the case that these experts suddenly have this grand ability to deal with so many choices. No, they don't have time for all that. They see a pattern. They recognize it. They can boil it down to one or two choices. And so what that chess master sees is not a board of pieces, et cetera, patterns, strategies. And what that chess master is able to do is quickly dump out all the irrelevant options and zero in on one or two possibilities. And the same thing is happening when you're in the, in the emergency room. So I know we often focus a lot of attention on where they go wrong. I just want to make you understand the possible, why they could so easily go wrong. Right? But also, how incredible it is, how well they do most of the time. So ultimately, what is expertise? What is that thing that's called informed intuition that's actually bound to be correct? It's not coming from you know, my gut or my heart, you know, none of that. It's learning patterns. You will start to recognize these patterns. It might feel like it's coming from you know, other body parts, but really, it's pattern recognition. So that, as Herb Simon, the Nobel Prize winner said, 
Intuition is nothing more and nothing less than recognition. And so the way you develop expert intuition in a particular domain which you really care about is you constantly engage in experimentation plus evaluation. That's what your experience is composed of. What you're learning are patterns. Now, let's get to the other part of making important choices. I can do that on a task on a, in a particular competency that has some boundaries on it, where I know how to measure my outcomes, where I know what I want to achieve. I want to save this life. I want to win this game, et cetera. I want to learn how to be a great coach. Any kind of core competency. I want to be a great athlete. You can do that. But what about when you have to innovate? When you have to innovate, you have to come up with a pattern that doesn't exist right now. And you have to construct that pattern. How are you going to do that? OK, how are we doing on time? We are 3.42. It is 3.42. OK, so how are we going to innovate? I'm going to give you some homework. So. Um, Imagine you have a problem you want to solve. I want to give you an F set of exercises to leave you with. And you can practice this on each other. So imagine you have a problem. And pick a problem that you're willing to share sometime later today. And then I'm going to just give you the method. You have a problem, small or big, and you first generate ideas on your own. Okay, So you generate ideas on your own, solutions to that problem. Okay, great. You'll feel, some of you will feel good. Some of you will feel frustrated. That's normal. That's great. Just keep that. Okay? And if you feel great, know that most of your ideas suck. That's normal, too. Okay? Then what I want you to do, because most of our ideas, you know, they, they do suck. Right? Three out of ten <laughs> might work out. Okay? And that's a good sign. No, but it's great. You still want to create more and more ideas. Idea banks are very important. Okay? Then what I want you to do is you want to ask people, and this is a phenomenal group. This is the reason why you're supposed to network, by the way. Talk to people. Hey, have you seen a solution to this problem? OK? They will probably see a solution in a different way, in a different context. It will not work the way you need it to. So don't tell them all that stuff about, oh, it doesn't work for my situation. This is it. Just take the idea. Write it down. Say thank you. Okay? Uh, okay? Um, you're collecting their observations of solutions. They might give you wild ideas. You can collect those too, but those get lower ranked. Okay? Those are wild ideas. Those, you know, most of the time, they, just like our ideas suck, most of other people's ideas suck, but they still collect them. Okay? <laughs> what you're looking for are their observations of solutions. You collect those. Sooner or later, what you will be able to do is combine those solutions in a new way that solves your problem. Okay, that is the key to innovation. Now, sometimes people, um, and uh, there's a the, one of the findings is that it's usually better to ask dormant ties or people you don't know very well because they'll have solutions that come from different places, different experiences. The people who are close to you are in the same echo chamber. Similarly, when you think of your time as an innovator, 30% of your time working alone on average, 70% with others. Of that 70% with others, 30% with people you don't know very well, 70% with the people you know very well. What are you doing ultimately to be a successful innovator? To come up with a new pattern meaning you want to throw out that new idea out there in the world, whether it's a new solution to a problem at your company, whether it's a startup idea, whether it's a pivot you want to make in your personal life, that you want to increase the odds of that being a success. So you are collecting solutions which you will creatively combine in a new way to increase your chances of success. Okay? And this is a core principle that's actually not new. I mean, what I'm, the way I'm describing the method of doing it is potentially new to you, but the actual core of this idea goes back to Schumpeter, 
who told us that innovation, successful innovation, depends on new combinations of old ideas. So to end, I think that the power of choice does not come from our ability to pick. As the great French polymath Henri Poincaré once said, Invention consists of avoiding the constructing of useless combinations. <laughs> and consists of the constructing of useful combinations which are in infinite minority. So to invent is to discern, is to choose. Allow me to propose a corollary to all of you. To choose is to invent. As leaders, the power of choice does not come from your ability to stand before that vending machine and look at these rows and rows of options and simply point and say, I'll have that one. Your power from choice comes from your ability to construct those most meaningful options. So don't be afraid to lead. Don't be afraid to create. Remember that the modern hero is no longer the chosen one, but the one who chooses. She is self-made because choosing is not just a self, just not, it's not just an act of self-expression, but an act of creation. And it's as you make a few careful choices day in, day out, that you transform your lives and the world around you. And this is how we create our most beautiful and singular selves. Thank you very much. Good luck to all of you.